Throughout history, various ancient civilizations and cultures have left behind intriguing artifacts and symbols that continue to baffle archaeologists and historians. One enigmatic motif that has captured attention is the depiction of a handbag in ancient carvings, sculptures and artworks found across different countries and cultures. Interestingly, a man came forward and said that he discovered one of these handbags in the Middle East. He went on to detail that he's a digger that looks for ancient artifacts and notes that many of his discoveries have been sent to museums across the world. He shared this photograph with us, saying that it was his most recent discovery and that it closely resembled those handbags that can be seen in ancient Sumerian carvings. The man said that the handbag is a symbol characterized by its distinct shape and handle and has been discovered in diverse regions and time periods. From ancient Egypt to Mesopotamia, from Mesoamerica to Easter Island, representations of this enigmatic object have been unearthed, suggesting a shared significance across vast distances and cultural boundaries. The handbag appears in reliefs, statues and hieroglyphs, raising questions about its symbolic meaning and potential cultural exchange. Oddly enough, he said that when he discovered this artifact, someone approached him about buying it. He found this strange, as at the time he didn't tell anyone about the discovery and found it odd how this individual knew about this object. The digger said the man was very keen to buy it and asked whether anyone had seen it, at which point he said that he hadn't shared any photographs of it. What the man found strange about this individual was how badly they wanted this artifact, and the digger said that to this day this was the most expensive item he sold saying that the mysterious individual gave him tens of thousands of dollars for it. When the digger asked the man about his name and where he was from, he said that the strange individual ignored him, but did say that before he left, the man said that if he found any more of these items, that he would be in contact. The digger found this strange, as he had never seen this man before, and couldn't understand where he came from and how he knew about this discovery. Luckily enough, the digger had taken some photographs of the objects shortly before he was approached and was able to share them with us. As of right now, the digger is baffled by the experience and couldn't understand why the man wanted the object so desperately. He didn't take a photograph of him, but did describe him as being very tall, wearing a black suit with black shoes and talking in a very monotone voice. He said that he's never seen the man before and that he didn't blend in with anyone from the area. The digger said that he has no idea where the artifact was taken or whether it was purchased by a museum or for himself. Scholars and researchers have proposed various interpretations for the handbag symbol. Some believe it represents a vessel of power or knowledge carrying the secrets of ancient civilizations or spiritual wisdom. Others associate it with the concept of rebirth, symbolizing the journey of the soul or the transition between different realms. The handbag has also been linked to prosperity suggesting a connection to rituals or beliefs related to sustenance and growth. The presence of the handbag symbol across different cultures and geographical locations highlights the possibility of cross-cultural connections and exchanges in ancient times. It suggests that ancient civilizations might have shared ideas, concepts, or even physical artifacts through trade routes, migrations, or cultural interactions. The symbolic journey of the handbag implies a common thread that unites seemingly disparate cultures in their understanding of the world and its mysteries. The handbag symbol has sparked numerous theories and speculations. Some propose advanced influence, suggesting that ancient civilizations received advanced knowledge or technology from otherworldly beings. Others interpret it as a symbol of a lost civilization or an ancient global culture that predates known history. However, these theories remain speculative and further research and archaeological evidence are necessary to provide conclusive explanations. The enigmatic handbag symbol found in ancient carvings across cultures and countries continues to captivate the imagination and provoke questions about our shared human experience. Its presence suggests a common language of symbolism that transcended time and geographic boundaries. While interpretations vary, the handbag remains a potent symbol representing mystery, power, and hidden knowledge. Unraveling its true meaning requires interdisciplinary research, comparative analysis, and a deeper understanding of the cultures that left behind these ancient depictions. 
the handbag symbol invites us to embark on a symbolic journey, connecting the threads of humanity's past and offering a glimpse into the universal concepts that unite us. The ancient Sumerians, who inhabited the land of Mesopotamia, present-day southern Iraq, between the 4th and 3rd millennia BCE, were a remarkable civilization that laid the foundation for many aspects of human culture and civilization. Central to their worldview was a diverse pantheon of gods and goddesses, each associated with different aspects of life, nature, and the divine order. The Sumerian pantheon was a complex assembly of gods and goddesses, with each deity holding specific dominion over various realms. Among the prominent deities were Anu, the god of the heavens, Enlil, the lord of the air and storms, and Inanna, the goddess of love. The divine hierarchy established the power dynamics among the gods, with Enlil often regarded as the highest authority. Sumerian mythology featured captivating creation stories and narratives that explained the origins of the universe and humanity. One of the most renowned tales is the Enuma Elish, which describes the struggle for supremacy between the gods, culminating in the creation of the world. Another notable myth involves the epic hero Gilgamesh, who embarks on a quest for immortality, showcasing themes of mortality, friendship, and the nature of divinity. The gods played a significant role in Sumerian society, influencing various aspects of life, from governance and law to agriculture and warfare. The king, as the representative of the gods on earth, held a sacred role and derived his authority from divine endorsement. Legal codes and administrative systems were established with the gods' guidance, ensuring justice, order, and social harmony. Additionally, the gods were invoked for protection, success in battle, and bountiful harvests. Sumerian religion and mythology had a profound impact on subsequent cultures in Mesopotamia and beyond. One of the most significant contributions of the Sumerians was the development of the first known writing system, known as cuneiform. Using wedge-shaped impressions on clay tablets, Sumerian scribes recorded economic transactions, religious texts, historical accounts, and literature. Cuneiform was a complex system that allowed for the dissemination of knowledge, fostering the growth of literature and the preservation of cultural heritage. The Sumerians established some of the earliest known legal codes, such as the Code of Urnamu and the Code of Lipit Ishtar, which laid the groundwork for later legal systems. These codes emphasized justice, fairness, and the protection of individual rights. Additionally, the Sumerians developed administrative systems, with officials responsible for taxation, record-keeping, and maintaining public infrastructure. These innovations facilitated governance and the efficient management of a growing society. The Sumerians had a rich and complex religious belief system centered around polytheism. They worshipped a diverse pantheon of gods and goddesses, each associated with different aspects of life, nature, and the divine order. Their religious rituals and ceremonies played a vital role in society, ensuring the well-being and prosperity of their communities. The legacy of the Sumerians extends far beyond their own civilization. Their inventions and cultural achievements heavily influenced later civilizations in Mesopotamia and beyond. The cuneiform script spread to other cultures, including the Akkadians, Babylonians, and Assyrians. Legal principles and administrative systems developed by the Sumerians provided a blueprint for future governance structures. Sumerian myths and religious motifs influenced the pantheons and beliefs of subsequent cultures. The Sumerians laid the groundwork for the development of urbanization, agriculture and complex social structures, leaving an indelible mark on human history. The Sumerians harnessed their ingenuity to improve agricultural practices and maximize productivity. They constructed intricate irrigation systems, such as canals and dikes, to divert water from rivers and distribute it to their fields. This allowed for year-round cultivation, enhancing crop yields and supporting a growing population. The use of the plough, pulled by oxen, revolutionized farming by facilitating efficient tilling of the soil and preparing it for planting. The Sumerians were skilled in working with metals, particularly copper and bronze. They developed techniques to extract and refine these metals, enabling the production of tools, weapons and decorative objects. 
Copper and bronze alloys were employed in the creation of intricate jewellery, statuettes, and ornamental items, showcasing the Sumerians' artistic sensibilities and craftsmanship. The Sumerians recognized the importance of transportation and trade for their expanding civilization. They constructed road networks connecting various city-states and established river trade routes, utilizing boats and barges to transport goods along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Their mastery of watercraft allowed for efficient movement of goods, facilitating trade with distant regions and fostering cultural exchange. Sumerian architecture reflected their advanced understanding of engineering principles. They constructed impressive structures using mud bricks, designing multi-story buildings with flat roofs and intricate facades. The Sumerians developed innovative construction methods, including the use of arches, vaults and buttresses, which provided stability and allowed for the construction of monumental edifices such as ziggurats and city walls. Since the origin of man, there has been controversy over religion and ultimately the purpose of human life on this earth. Because there are countless religions and interpretations of why we are here, people have lots of different answers to that one important question. Who created us? Christianity has broken into many sectors throughout the years, each adhering to their own moral codes and interpreting the Bible in different ways. Like any piece of the literature, the Bible is indeed up to interpretation. However, it's hard to interpret a story when it was never told in the first place. According to the Ethnography Museum of Ankara in Turkey, a new version of the Bible believed to be between 1,500 and 2,000 years old has resurfaced and it's caused upheaval to the Christian faith. This is because this Bible includes the Gospel of Barnabas. The story reveals that Jesus Christ was never nailed to the cross and that he was also not the Son of God. This story insists that Jesus was only a prophet and that his fate was not crucifixion, but that he instead made it to heaven. However, the story of crucifixion is not completely lost. In this story, Judas Iscariot was believed to be nailed to the cross instead. This book came to light during a heist when a group of thieves attempted to smuggle highly valuable goods across the Mediterranean Sea. This version of the Bible is believed to be worth over $25 million dollars, due to its shocking revelations and antiquity. It's no secret that the world of Christianity and the world of Islam have been at odds for years. However, this contention is largely based on how we as people should interpret Jesus' place in the Bible and thus honor him thereafter. Because this new biblical story reveals that Jesus quite possibly knew the prophet Muhammad and foresaw his arrival, it can be said that if Christians do decide to honor this new gospel, then their teachings and belief systems might align differently. However, it's common practice of any church, but especially the Christian church, to pick and choose which stories they want to include in modern practice. It takes a keen scholarly eye to authenticate the true intent of Jesus' word at the conception of the Bible, but it takes only several elders of the church to manipulate the transcriptions to align with modern belief systems. While the Vatican remains highly interested in this new finding, it cannot be said whether the entirety of Christianity will change because of it. We do know one thing, though. If this gospel stayed hidden from us for more than 2,000 years, then it's reasonable to wonder what else is out there. Best-seller book and Hollywood hit movie, The Da Vinci Code, written by Dan Brown, sparked theories and controversy surrounding the Vatican. The intense fame of this work focused the attention of theorists towards the Vatican, placing the mysteries of the archives into the public spotlight of pop culture. Despite Brown's insistence that 99% of the contents are factual, the claims are heavily refuted by the Catholic Church. Brown's work claimed that Jesus Christ had married Mary Magdalene and had children with her, creating a traceable bloodline with potential descendants alive today. The Da Vinci Code is not the first book of its kind, although it has seen notable fame and success. Since the Da Vinci Code made such claims surrounding Jesus and the Church, conjecture grew, and popular theories now suggest that the true bloodline of Jesus Christ is concealed within the Vatican Apostolic Archives. One piece of supposed evidence for the theory that Jesus had a wife and children, and subsequent descendants alive today, is that there is little known about Christ between his birth and early childhood, and then the years before his death, in his early thirties. The focus of Christ's life within the Bible is largely on his birth, and work leading to his crucifixion, hence the Christmas and Easter celebrations. 
But what was Jesus doing in the other 20 years of his life? This is the question many have begun asking. For many, marrying, having children, creating a family is a probable assumption. It's certainly the one made by Dan Brown. The Bible states Mary of Magdala was a follower and traveled with Jesus. However, Brown and other theorists believe their relationship to one another was more intimate and suggest that the two married. So, what do we believe could be within the Vatican Apostolic Archives? Documentation of Jesus' bloodline potentially being held within the Vatican is a relatively common theory, though the form of this documentation is also in debate. Some believe messages and letters between St. Paul and Emperor Nero contain first-person accounts surrounding Jesus Christ's life, including a written record of his bloodline. Others believe individuals who had seen Jesus personally had drawn portraits of Jesus, and these are contained within the Vatican Apostolic Archives. The earliest, publicly known portraits of Jesus were created approximately 200 years after his death. Why does the Catholic Church need to protect the knowledge surrounding the bloodline of Jesus Christ, if it is indeed contained within the Vatican Apostolic Archives? The answer here is likely rather simple. Evidence of Jesus' bloodline has the potential to contradict the teachings of the Church and therefore undermine Holy Scripture. The implications of Jesus having descendants is a complicated thought. If the relatives of Christ, and therefore the relatives of God, were alive and accessible, then the role of the Pope would be far less significant. However, realistically, after tracing a bloodline for hundreds of generations, the vast majority of people would be related. Tracing a bloodline back for only 20 generations could find up to a million relatives, and with the ever-increasing population, locating the closest descendant would be an ever-challenging task. If the Vatican Apostolic Archives holds documentation of Jesus' bloodline, how updated is it? And with such a vast number of descendants, do you think the bloodline could be traced through to modern society? Do you think revealing this knowledge would conflict with the teachings of the Bible, the Church and Holy Scripture? Christians have long held any sacred remnants from the time period when Jesus walked the earth. Ancient Catholics stormed the world in search of anything that they could bring back to Europe, from holy relics mentioned in the Bible to bone fragments of a saint, so that they might have a physical memorial for reverence in their sanctuaries. Although there is a long history of falsifying artifacts for the sake of profit or prominence, one of the most hotly contested of these is the Shroud of Turin, also known as the Holy Shroud. This piece of linen, found in the 14th century, bears a negative image of a man that some believe to be Jesus Christ and claim that the cloth is his burial shroud. The cloth was denounced in 1389 as a fake, a claim that faced heated opposition, and the modern-day Catholic Church has neither denounced nor endorsed the shroud. Recently, new details have emerged. The Shroud of Turin's authenticity has been heavily debated since its first appearance in 1390 while also holding firm the position as one of the most well-known relics of the Catholic Church. Finally, in 1988, a team of scientists were given permission to cut small samples of the cloth and sent it to three different laboratories, all of whom independently dated the cloth to 1260 to 1390 AD. However, even these seemingly definitive results were contested, as critics claimed that the test swatches were from relatively more recent areas where the shroud had been patched contaminated by a fire in the 16th century, or delivered inaccurate results due to the number of people who have handled the cloth over the centuries. There is vast amounts of evidence for both sides. Firstly, the shroud depicts the full body image of a man lying with his hands crossed over himself as though for burial, with markings on his wrists. In the Middle Ages, Jesus Christ was always depicted with crucifixion marks over his palms, although in biblical days, they would in fact have driven the stakes through the wrists. Additionally, experts remain mystified as to what could have created such an accurate negative image of a man on the cloth. Tests analysing the cloth have found no evidence of pigments, paints, dyes or stains on the fibre, while also confirming that at some point in its past, the cloth had been in direct contact with a body. However, some experts believe that the Middle Ages date of the shroud points to its use as a burial shroud for a crucifixion victim of the day, centuries after Jesus was crucified. Adding to speculation, in 2018, a bloodstain pattern analysis was performed on the shroud and concluded that the faint blood flow stains came from different angles and were not produced by one body as it was being laid out for burial. 
Believers in the Shroud have also pointed out that the Middle Ages radiocarbon date could have been based on years of the Shroud being on public display for believers to touch, kiss and pray over after its reveal in the 14th century. As well as possible carbon monoxide contamination, both instances which could conceivably cause a 1st century artifact to be inaccurately dated as Middle Ages. No paints or substances. No matter which side of the authenticity argument you find yourself on, an enduring mystery of the shroud is the source of the image of a man. If it were painted on as part of the supposed forgery of the Middle Ages, chemists would be able to analyze and identify the chemical profiles of the pigments used, as well as identify microscopic signs of brush strokes, both of which are conspicuously lacking. In fact, there is no evidence of any form of paint, dye or any other substance being used to darken the fibers, it's as if the individual fibers simply changed color of their own accord, presumably from chemical reactions as a result of laying upon the body as the burial shroud of Jesus Christ. Laying on a human form in this manner could result in the chemical darkening of the cellulose fibers of the cloth with the application of even very mild heat, although other burial shrouds don't usually bear negative images of the person they encapsulated. Additionally, there is the presence of bloodstains and badly decomposed DNA that points to the fact that this was likely used for some type of body. Another hypothesis for the source of the image stems from the fact that the image imprinted on the cloth is a negative, that is the dark and bright parts of the image are reversed, which is a technique in photography. Some argue that if the cloth were indeed a medieval forgery, the image could have conceivably been imprinted on the cloth using primitive photography materials that would have been accessible such as silver nitrate and a quartz lens. Researchers have been able to create replications of the shroud using these simple techniques, although they haven't been successful in making the image remain on the cloth when the silver is removed. However, most theorists acknowledge that this is a stretch of the imagination as there is no documentation of any sort of knowledge of this type, and the odds of no mention of such a groundbreaking technology being made in any surviving record is slim. The fact that the image is likely not man-made, but possibly rather the result of a chemical happenstance, refutes the theory that the Shroud of Turin was a clever forgery of the Middle Ages, and the radiocarbon dating rules out the authenticity of it being a first-century burial shroud. Theory moderates combine these two compelling pieces of evidence and suggest that perhaps the linen was the shroud of a crucified man in the Middle Ages, something that was not unheard of for the time. Whether or not the Shroud of Turin is ever proven to be authentic or merely a forgery, it's nonetheless an incredibly powerful artifact that contributes greatly to the faith of millions of people all over the world. Even from the perspective of non-believers, the Shroud is a powerful archaeological piece dating back to the Middle Ages with a shockingly accurate depiction of a crucified human. Although how this image appeared on the cloth will likely remain a hotly debated mystery, the significance of the Shroud of Turin cannot be contested, no matter which side you fall on. As of right now, there's still many questions that remain unanswered when talking about religion. The Vatican Apostolic Archives, also known as the Vatican Secret Archives, is one of the oldest and most important archives in the world, containing historical documents dating back to the 8th century. The archives contain a vast collection of documents related to the Catholic Church, including letters, papal bulls, diplomatic correspondence, and other important historical records. In recent years, the Vatican has made efforts to increase access to the archives, and many documents have been digitized and made available online. Nonetheless, due to the sheer volume of documents in the archives, many of its contents remain largely unexplored and mysterious. Nikola Tesla was a Serbian-American inventor, electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, and futurist. He is best known for his contributions to the design of the modern alternating current electricity supply system. Tesla was born in Smiljan, Croatia, then part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and studied engineering and physics in Austria and Czech Republic. After working for several years in Europe, he emigrated to the United States in 1884. In 1887, Tesla developed the concept of the alternating current electrical supply system, which is still used today for power transmission and distribution. Tesla also invented numerous other electrical devices, including the Tesla coil, a type of resonant transformer used in wireless communication, and the Tesla turbine, a bladeless turbine that uses fluid to generate power. Tesla was a prolific inventor, 
and held over 300 patents in his lifetime. He also contributed to the fields of robotics, radar, and computer science. Despite his many accomplishments, Tesla struggled financially in his later years and passed away in relative obscurity in New York City in 1943. However, his legacy has endured and he is widely regarded as one of the greatest inventors of all time. Going back a few years ago, the FBI released 64 pages of unreleased documents and these were of particular interest because for many years theories had been floating around as to why Tesla's work was collected by the government. Many argued that the majority of Tesla's inventions would never work, so if this was the case, why then did the United States government quickly swoop in and collect his work shortly after he had passed away? Even the Central Intelligence Agency has released some interesting documents about the inventor and again have detailed that they collected some of his work shortly after he passed away. As many have pointed out, something had obviously caught these agencies' attention, as they soon collected his work in order to comb through what he had been working on. One of their reasons for doing this was to ensure that any work of his didn't get into the wrong hands. For this reason, they decided it would be best if the documents remained in the property of the Office of Alien Property Custodian. However, this was until the documents and other pieces of Tesla's work mysteriously disappeared after the war. Interestingly, one document that was released by the Central Intelligence Agency reads as follows. He was particularly interested in high-frequency mechanical and electrical vibrations. He once claimed that, with only a pocket-sized vibrator, he could generate tremors that would split the Earth in two. Some of his experiments were fantastic, like something out of an early film version of Dr. Frankenstein's monster. He built enormous coils at his laboratory near Colorado Springs, with which he generated up to 12 million volts of electricity and hurled bolts of artificial lightning hundreds of feet through the air. End quote. Much of what he did was shrouded in mystery, and some of his experiments have never been duplicated. Some admirers claim that Tesla foresaw the so-called Star Wars program. He tried to sell the War Department on the idea of building death rays that he claimed could melt enemy warplanes at distances of hundreds of miles. Some of those papers are held even now in the archives of various United States intelligence and defense agencies, where they are studied for clues that might be useful in modern weaponry. These are some extracts from the official FBI documents that got released. On 26th and 27th of January 1943, an examination was made of the technical papers of Dr. Nikola Tesla, which after his death had been stored in the Manhattan warehouse in New York City. This examination was made for the purpose of determining if any ideas of significant value in the present United States war effort could be found among his possessions. Participating in this examination were Mr. John C. Newington, New York Office of the Alien Property Custodian, Dr. Charles of the Washington Office of Scientific Research and Development, and John G. Trump of the Office of Scientific Research and Development of Massachusetts Institute on Technology. The following papers, which were regarded as typical of Nikola Tesla's writings and thoughts in the period of 1925 to 1942, were removed for the purpose of record and listed below in random order in which they were found, together with a brief individual abstract. Exhibit A Possibilities of Electrostatic Generators An updated article probably written about 1934 discussing the possibilities, as a source of high-voltage DC power, of the Van de Graaff type of electrostatic belt generator. The article states correctly the electrostatic principles employed in this device and points out that suck generators are not suitable for commercial high-powered applications, though of undoubted scientific value. Tesla's wireless tower, erected in 1902 on Long Island, is stated in this memorandum to have charged to 30 million volts. Exhibit B, Reactive Force of Glycerin and Dynamite An undated memorandum involving some calculation of the explosive power of certain compounds and then deviating to a discussion of the possibility of transmitting power by mechanical vibrations along the Earth's crust. Exhibit C, Process of Degasifying, Refining and Purifying Metals a 40-page memorandum probably written about 1930 dealing with the above subject and proposing new theories of capillarity and surface tension. These correspondence indicated that this had been submitted to various industrial companies. Exhibit D. Replying to Antorg regarding the generation of high voltage and acceleration of charged particles. This document dated 8th of November 1935 
answers questions raised by Soviet engineers and scientists regarding Tesla's proposal of Ray. From this answer, it's deduced that the proposal concerned the generation of high voltages by electrostatic means. These means consisted of a high-voltage terminal, presumably supported on an insulating column, and charged by a gaseous charge conveying medium passing between ground and terminal. The ideas contained in this memorandum are fairly similar to the bolt conveyor electrostatic generator methods proposed by Van de Graaff and do not appear to offer any unusual features. Exhibit E, Art of Telegeodynamics, or Art of Producing Terrestrial Motions at Distance. This document in the form of a letter dated 12 June 1940 to the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company proposes a method for the transmission of large amounts of power over vast distances by means of mechanical vibrations on the Earth's crust. The source of power is a mechanical or electromechanical device bolted to some rocky protuberance and importing power at a resonance frequency of the Earth's crust. The proposed scheme appears to be completely visionary and unworkable. Westinghouse's reply indicates their polite rejection of this idea. Tesla said the following during an interview. I wanted to illuminate the whole Earth. There is enough electricity to become a second sun. Light would appear around the equator as a ring around Saturn. Mankind is not ready for the great and good. In Colorado Springs, I soaked the Earth with electricity. Also, we can water other energies, such as positive mental energy. They are in the music of great composers or in the verses of great poets. In the Earth's interior, there are energies of joy, peace and love. Their expressions are a flower that grows from the Earth, the food we get out of her, and everything that makes man's homeland. I've spent years looking for the way that this energy could influence people. The beauty and the scent of roses can be used as a medicine, and the sun rays as a food. Life has an infinite number of forms, and the duty of scientists is to find them in every form of matter. Three things are essential in this. All that I do is search for them. I know I will not find them, but I will not give up on them. Many who worked with Nikola Tesla, along with documents that have been released in recent years, show that Tesla created or at least worked on a device known as a death ray or peace ray. It's reported that this incredible device could destroy or disable enemy targets using directed energy. What's interesting about this is that in recent years the United States Navy has come forward and said that they are now actively using this technology, saying that it has the ability to shoot targets out of the sky. In fact, the United States Navy said that they are now in possession of the most powerful laser on the planet. Some have questioned whether this technology came from Nikola Tesla. Tesla did have an interest in directed energy and particle beam technology and he did conduct experiments related to these fields in the later years of his life. However, it's unclear whether any of these experiments ever produced a practical weapon, or whether they were simply theoretical in nature. In any case, Tesla was known more for his contributions to electrical engineering, including the development of the alternating current electrical system, wireless communication, and numerous other inventions that have had a significant impact on modern technology. In his life, Nikola Tesla had hundreds of patents and was considered a master of his time, being able to look at things with an open mind, one of these being the vibrational properties of the space around us. A famous Tesla quote is the following, If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. He understood how physical vibrations worked and the effects they had on the human body, both good and bad. Tesla was the man responsible for helping his friend Mark Twain beat his constipation. Vibrational therapy is something that modern scientists have found interesting, with one recent study showing researchers that wounds exposed to vibration five times a week for 30 minutes healed more quickly than normal wounds. With the scientists saying that wounds exposed to vibration formed more granulation tissue, a type of tissue important early in the wound healing process. Nikola Tesla penned an open letter to talk about the process saying the following. During the past few weeks I have received so many letters concerning the same subject that it was entirely beyond my power to answer all of them individually. In view of this, I hope that I shall be excused for the delay, which I must regret, in acknowledging the receipt, and also for addressing this general communication in answer to all inquiries. The many pressing demands which have been made upon me in consequence of exaggerated statements of the journals have painfully impressed me with the fact that there are a great many sufferers, 
and furthermore that nothing finds a more powerful echo than a promise held out to improve the condition of the unfortunate ones. The members of the medical fraternity are naturally more deeply interested in the task of relieving the suffering from their pain, and, as might be expected, a great many communications have been addressed to me by physicians. To these, chiefly, this brief statement of the actual facts is addressed. Some journals have confounded the physiological effects of electrical oscillations with those of mechanical vibrations, this being probably due to the circumstance that a few years ago I brought to the attention of the scientific men some novel methods and apparatus for the production of electrical oscillations, which I learn are now largely used in some modification or other in electrotherapeutic treatment and otherwise. To dispel this idea, I wish to state that the effects of purely mechanical vibrations, which I have more recently observed, have nothing to do with the former. Mechanical vibrations have often been employed locally with pronounced results in the treatment of diseases, but it seems that the effects I refer to have either not been noted at all, or if so, only to a small degree, evidently because of the insufficiency of the means which have eventually been employed in the investigations. While experimenting with a novel contrivance, constituting in its simplest form a vibrating mechanical system, in which from the nature of the construction the applied force is always in resonance with the natural period, I frequently exposed my body to continued mechanical vibrations. As the elastic force can be made as large as desired, and the applied force used be very small, great weights, half a dozen persons for instance, may be vibrated with great rapidity by a comparatively small apparatus. I observed that such intense mechanical vibrations produce remarkable physiological effects. They powerfully affect the condition of the stomach, undoubtedly promoting the process of digestion and relieving the feeling of distress, often experienced in consequence of the imperfect function of the organs concerned in the process. They have a strong influence upon the liver, causing it to discharge freely, similarly to an application of a cathartic. They also seem to affect the glandular system, notably in the limbs, also the kidneys and bladder, and more or less influence the whole body. When applied for a longer period, they produce a feeling of immense fatigue, so that a profound sleep is induced. The excessive tiring of the body is generally accompanied by nervous relaxation, but there seems to be a specific action on the nerves. These observations, though incomplete, are, in my own limited judgment, nevertheless positive and unmistakable. And in view of this, and of the importance of further investigation of the subject, I prepared about a year ago a machine with suitable adjustments for varying the frequency and amplitude of the vibrations, intending to give it to some medical faculty for investigation. This machine, together with other apparatus, was unfortunately destroyed by fire a year ago, but will be reconstructed as soon as possible. End quote. So, what do you make of these incredible Nikola Tesla discoveries? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comment section below and help us to grow this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.